All right, Scott, we've got waterwaystravel.com with us today, the experts in surf travel experiences. Heck yeah, we've got waterways travel. Yes, we do. Um, look, when you travel, you want the best. You want the most experienced. You want the people that know what they're doing. This is waterways travel. 30 plus years in business now and um, locations around the world. The thing is, travel is tedious. There's tons of minutia. There's stressors. Let somebody else handle all of that stuff. Just enjoy. Show up. Score good waves. Know what to be prepared for. They'll tell you what boards to bring, how to pack, all of those expectations. So um, like I said, locations around the world in every level of luxury. If you want to stay in a yacht, they'll get that dialed for you. They've got yacht connections. If you want to stay in a land camp and just have kind of comfort and, um, you know, access to waves, they have that available too. So, and every level of surf, pumping surf, cloud break, all the way down to super rippable stuff too. So they're the experts in the space, waterwaystravel.com. And when you go, bring your drifties. Yeah, of course. I mean, anywhere you go where, you, where you're wearing board shorts, I got my drifties with me right now. And um, wherever it's warm water, drifties with the half millimeter liner, wetsuit liner, incredible board shorts, function, fashion. I own two pair and I'm a huge fan of the drifties. Yeah, it'll, and we'll save you 15% too on driftline.co, promo code SPIT. As we see some movement at the takeoff zone, it's Kelly Slater grabbing rail. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy. David, it's Thursday, August 15th. This is Spit, and we're talking all things surf on this um, glorious day. Good day. To, good to see you. Good to see you, Scott. Um, since I saw you last week, your boy Al Cleland had a huge win. You were, you were calling him for the Olympics, which that was incorrect, but little did we know. You were only about a week off with your prediction because <laughs> he took down the win at the U.S. Open. Yeah, it's a really a great win for Alan, right? You and I spoke about, he reminds me, he's in sort of the same space that Jack Robinson was in a few years ago, where everyone knew that this guy needs to be on the CT. His um, level of surfing is such that, he, you know, he'll be mind blowing in really good waves that the CT is supposed to offer. And, um, and now he's proven himself in the absolute crap at Huntington Beach. He absolutely ripped the bags out of the final at the closing you know, moments of the heat. And um, I believe I was talking to Daryl Goodrum about it. I think Daryl's his coach. Oh, OK. And I believe there's two more. Is that what now? Maybe, you know, is that a 10,000 point challenger series event? Yes. CS. So there's, so there's two others. So, I mean, Alan Cleland's in a great position to be on the CT next year. I think he has to go to Aracera in Brazil, and he has to go to some other kind of shitty spot. No, that's it. Just uh, Aracera's next, and then Brazil's last, Sakurama. Yeah, so... But he's okay. in ninth. He's in ninth, so he's currently qualified. He's currently qualified. He's got to go do... You know, he needs to finish this up, and he'll be on the CT. And if Alan Cleland Jr. is on the CT, this is a wonderful thing for fans of of like legit power ripping style. This guy's got it all. Would he be the first Mexican to be on the CT? I think so. He's the first Mexican surfer that I could think of that would be at that level, male or female. Um, but don't quote me on that. But he jumped 42 pay, uh, spots with this US Open win. And let's be honest, I did not have him pegged for the US Open. Even that final wave that you're talking about, it's almost a shame to me that that is now the wave that he's known for because yeah. it's just so not his strength. You know, I mean, he did what he needed to do. It was a, for those who didn't watch, it was a buzzer beater moment where he needed a score. He got it. Um, maybe even after the horn sounded, like he got to his feet, maybe it sounded while he was on the wave, but it was buzzer beater. When we watched Repeater, the Quicksilver film a year ago, he had clips in Repeater that we discussed. And we we're just like, oh, my God, they're huge. Way I mean, not huge. Ways, Ireland or Scotland or something, right? That and then also like over 
well overhead, big punchy sections that he's doing huge, massive aerials on and getting barreled and all that kind of stuff. So like that is what we know him for and love him for and why he's cemented in our brains. And so going into the U.S. Open, I was he was not my pick to win. But as he was making it through, was um, definitely rooting for him. So 42 positions moved up the rankings into ninth. So it's still precarious. You know, that's how much things can change on the CS. Yeah. But it's great to see him in qualifying position. No, it'll be a disservice to the WSL if he's not on the CT. He, he's and I know it's up to him. Like they're giving him a path. Unfortunately, you know, there's some shitty waves coming up. But like you say, he just did really well in pretty crappy Huntington. By the way, I remember watching him not too long ago. I think in the, I want to say in the spring. Don't they have an event there called the Jacks event? Jacks mm -hmm. Shop at Huntington Pier. He was killing it in that, and it was. Another, you know, I mean, it was Huntington and whatever. It was three to four foot Southern California, you know, surf. It's, but Allen's got the competitive chops to do what needs to get done in, in, you know, whatever's thrown at. It. And we just all know that, look, let's put him out, you know, at Sunset Beach, at Cloud Break, at Chopu. This is where he's going to shine and he's going to be a real threat. Yeah. Um, do you want to? Remind listeners, for those who don't know, what's your connection to Al? Well, I don't really have a full-on connection to Alvin, but to Al, uh, Alan, but his father was one of the sort of the pioneers of Pesquales. He's from Coronado, Imperial Beach area. And when myself and others went down to Pesquales in, in the 80s, Alan was one of the guys that was there. He's a couple of years older than me. And it was like Jimmy Downs, Danny Downs, Alan Cleland, some other guys from Solana Beach that were Pasquale's um, regulars. And a couple of guys, just many of them moved down there and lived down there. You know, Kendall Summers. There was a whole crew of 80s, 1980s era surfers. And um, and Al, so Alan was a guy from San Diego that if, when you went down there, he was down there, always down there. Um, surfing so I don't really know him but I've surfed with him and um, and you know we kind of hey how's it going you know like that yeah but when you see his kid pop up on a competitive scene you definitely or start rooting for him because of it well his dad was always a great surfer too you know yeah. we just remember oh Alan's out you know it's going to be good or whatever yeah well notably the other surfer in the final on the men's side there was Marco Mignot who is a French surfer but lives in Saulita, Mexico. So I associate him with Mexico. I was kind of surprised to see the French flag. I almost forgot he was French. So in theory, you could say that that was uh two Mexican surfers in the final, which I think is pretty unique. That's cool. Yeah, that's great to see. And I know the Mexican surf fans were going crazy in Huntington Beach and uh it, it was good energy, you know. It was a great, yeah. I mean, wasn't a great viewing event other than for one day, but it was great. It's always a great competitive event. On the women's side, we had Sally Fitzgibbons take her win, uh, which positions her in first on the rankings, meaning she could re-qualify for tour yet again. And then <laughs> Bella Kenworthy um, with a big come up. She just came off of a win at Belito contest, it was, and then uh, second place here. So she's squarely positioned in second place. So we'd likely see her on the CT tour next year as well. Oh, well, that would be cool. And talk about polar opposites. Uh, Sally Fitzgibbons, who's been on tour, seems like for a very long time. Um, I, I bet more than 10 years, maybe 15. Oh, yeah. And um, you know what? I kind of am stoked for Sally Fitzgibbons. She's always, in my opinion, sort of been in the shadows of, you know, the Lane Beachleys or the Carissa Moores or the Stephanie Gilmores or the Tyler Wrights. Like, she's never really you know, broken through to that level. She's always, you know, she's competitively, she's incredible. Um, she's obviously, you know, obviously when you're on tour for 15 years and here she is, she gets kicked off tour and she's trying to requalify. And um, it's kind of like a, a feel good story a little bit. At least that's the way I look at it. Yeah. I am. Um, I'm apprehensive to deliver my next <laughs> salvo because she is like, um, She's such a great ambassador and such a beloved Australian, you know, icon. However, uh, <laughs> yeah. you're right. You're right. Her rookie year is 2009. So she's been on, in our world anyway, she wasn't on tour the entire time, but she's been on the CT uh, for probably 11 of those 15 years. Um, but she's 
got bumped off multiple times and had to requalify multiple times. And so I am not necessarily thrilled to see her recall. Like seeing Bella Kenworthy, I'm like, sweet, fresh blood, new style of surfing. Let's yeah. curious yeah. how that factors in with everybody else. But yeah. Sally, when I was watching her in Huntington, she's undeniable. The surfing that she's doing, I'm recognizing will get the scores and she's going to win a heat and she's going to win this contest potentially. So I can't take anything away from her. It's just not exciting, nor the future of surfing. And the distinction that I've made with her that I will still stand by is there's no point of difference to her surfing. So I think she had at least five second place finishes in her CT career. And when she lost to somebody, Stephanie Gilmore, Steph had a point of difference, which of course is style. Carissa Moore had a point of difference, which might be power, you know, or there was always a very distinct something that that person who was in first place was better at than everybody else in the field. And I feel like Sally was just, she was 70% at everything, but not a hundred percent at any one thing. And so when you watch her in a heat, you're like, okay, she's getting through. And if somebody surfs to 60%, that's why she's going to constantly make quarterfinal heats because she's that consistent. But I want to see her create, that was, it would be what she needs to do when she does qualify for next season is to really stamp a distinct point of difference in her surfing from everybody else. That's what I would like to see. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to see that or not. You're right. Um, I, one thing that, that she'll bring that is sort of, I don't want to say it's secondary, but it could be a good thing for the Bella Kenworthies of the world is that she's a competitive animal. In other words, when a young rookie like Bella Kenworthy gets it, goes up against Stephanie Gilmore or excuse me, um, Sally Fitzgibbons, she's going to learn something from the, mm -hmm. from the heat, you know, like those young rookies, I'm sure when they draw Sally, they're like, oh shit, this chick's been on tour for a long, like she knows, like, you know what I mean? Like there could be a learning curve that's accentuated and accelerated because these rookies get to face Sally Fitzgibbon. So from that side of the equation, maybe she's good for, I agree with you, you know, I agree with no. you. Like, like we've seen Sally Fitzgibbon, it, Gibbons, it's not going to change. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're not going to see anything next year. You're not going to see radical aerials or anything like that. No, but, but you're right. You're right too. Something good for the young girls. You're right too. When she, when a Bella Kenworthy draws her, Sally's going to get the first wave and it's going to be a six, five. Yeah. And then she's going to get a next wave and it's going to be a seven. And then a third wave is going to be a seven, five. And she's not going to make a priority mistake. And so Bella's back is going to be against the wall and she's going to have to work her way out of that, you know? So that yeah. is a good thing competitively, but as a competitor, or I'm, I'm sorry, as a viewer watching her surfing. Yeah. Lunchtime for me. Yeah, she's got a bit of Kanoa Igarashi, you know, guaranteed seven fives, but are we ever going to see nine fives? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But she will get those seven fives everywhere at Cloud Break to Huntington and everywhere in between. So she's a great surfer. There's no doubting that. But is it fresh, exciting, new? No, yeah. It's, no, it's not. But that does lead us to Cloud Break, um, which is coming. The opening window starts on the 20th. So that's Tuesday, five days away from now. Yeah. And, um, it will decide our final five surfers for lowers. So that's pretty exciting. It's very exciting. I'm I'm fired up. I have to change my fantasy team and get involved on that level. And of course, we're going to look at the swell and see what's going on with the swell. And uh, wouldn't it be great? You know, the South Pacific has been really active this year. So um could be really good. Do you want me to take a peek? Yeah, take a peek. For, while you're looking at the forecast, I'm going to read off who's in contention right now. The top uh, five on the men's side, John John Florence, in order, John John Florence, Griffin Colapinto, Jack Robinson, Italo is in the fourth position, and Ethan Ewing is in the fifth position. Now, interestingly, right outside of that, as contenders who can really do well at the next venue cloud break, Yago Dora in the sixth position. Jordy in the seventh position, questionable. Gabriel Medina in the eighth position. You would absolutely expect him to quarterfinal, semifinal, or win at cloud break. And then I wouldn't have expected to see Crosby Colapinto in contention. He's in the ninth spot, Rio White in the 10th, Jake Marshall in the 11th, and Cole Hauschman in the 12th. Well, that's it. Those are some interesting names. And I'll give you the... Quick forecast, 
It looks like there's a day on the 22nd, which is Thursday, the 22nd, two days after the start, where it's five to seven feet and good winds. The next day, four to six feet and good winds. How long does the waiting period go? What's the final day? Let me check. Because on the 31st, it's six to eight feet. Yeah, it's only the 29th, 20th to the 29th. Okay, and how many days do they need? Four? No, with the shorter uh, post cut, it's three. Well, they should be able to get the 22nd, the 23rd, and then the 28th. It's four to six feet. So it'll be ranging between five and seven and four to six with quite a few two to three, four, uh, three to four foot days that we hope they don't run in. But the thing is, is that winds are an issue. Like it's way too, even like, what are we? We're about five days out from the, from the start. You can't guarantee what the winds are going to do down there. It's just, you, you kind of got to wake up in the morning. I mean, the day before you'll get a good idea, but um, we'll have to see what the winds do. Okay. Well, do you have a pick? Um, <laughs> You mean to win? Yeah. Let's say to win to final. Um, I like, I like surfers that have got tons of experience there. So I'm going to say Jack Robinson. Interesting. Okay. I'm yeah. going, uh, I'm going to John, John Florence win at cloud break with a Gabriel Medina final. Yeah. That's the easy pick. I've, I expected you to go there. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, I'm, I'm going outside of the box with Jack Robinson. <laughs> it's not that far outside of the box, Scott. <laughs> I know. That's why I'm laughing. It's not at all. Um, I'm going John John just because John's been in scintillating form. I guess he got fifth at the last event. So maybe that's not super scintillating, but he did look good. Um, and then he was at lowers this week. So he's in town for um, Nathan Florence's Waterman of the Year Award. And it coincided with a hurricane swell. And so he was out at lowers and I saw some of the footage. I mean, blistering form. I mean, when we watched Felipe Toledo win titles out there and Ethan Ewing in those uh, days, those are the top, that was the top surfing I've ever seen at lowers, full stop, both those guys. John John out surfing them this past week at lowers. You know, it's everything that they were doing combined into one surfer. And, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter that Felipe is off tour this year because, you know, I don't think that he would be able to co compete in waves of consequence. Like he withdrew from those events already. But even if he was and surfing at lowers against John, John would still take him out. That's how I feel. Yeah. And so why do you think John was in town? For Nathan Florence's uh, yeah, Waterman, Water Waterman of the Year award. Yeah, that's what I thought too. All right. Well, that's cool. That'd be fun if you were a Grom. John John Florence paddles out. He'd be so psyched, you know. Totally, yeah, completely. So, and it's a wave everybody has experience at, obviously. So he doesn't need to be practicing out there necessarily. But if he's in town and there's hurricane swell, then why wouldn't he be? Mm -hmm. um, but all eyes on cloud break for the next week, and that's somewhere where he does to fit your criteria. He has plenty of experience out there as well, and so I'm expecting greatness. By the way, I um, have you watched the latest how surfers get paid? It's pretty good. Stellar, dude. It's like one of the best episodes. I agree. I'm I'm two thirds of the way through and I've got the last. I'm just at the part where they're talking about they're all out of Jaws. The finalists are there. They're all like kumbaya out in a circle. And Greg Long says, hey, let's just split the money. It's a beautiful day. And they're kind of talking about how that whole thing went down. And it's really fascinating. Well, um. So did you, were you not privy to the whole controversy that's happened since they released, released that episode? No, please film oh me. Gosh. Oh my gosh. This was the biggest oh, news of last week, man. Oh, you're kidding. Where have I been? I don't know anything about it. Did, did Billy Kemper like sue somebody? <laughs> not yet, but I wouldn't be surprised based on his uh, behavior. So they released that episode. Basically the entire episode is about the title of the episode is the day big wave camaraderie died. And what that is referencing is the moment you're talking about. Greg 
uh, the very first Jaws event. It was 2015. Right. Um, the waves were pumping early in the event, but as they're prepping for the final, they're out there literally in the channel. The waves really slowed down. There was this big lull. And Greg was like, look, Shane's injured. Like, we don't want to be out here going dog eat dog, like out positioning each other for waves. It is super, you know, it's a huge day, but now there's a lull. So we're really going to be scrapping. How about we all just split the prize money equally? And this is something Greg had done a couple of times before and everybody agreed to it. And that's what, you know, big wave surfing is. We're out here really looking out for one another and even rescuing each other at times. So that is the the kind of, despite this being a contest, that is kind of the ethos of big wave surfing. Anyways, he pitched that idea. Everybody agreed to it. And everybody, they interview most, I think four of the surfers that were in the final in this piece and all four give their story, their perspective on it. And Shane Dorian and Billy Kemper both kind of referenced that Billy was a little bit apprehensive, kind of like, um, I mean, I guess I'll go for it. You know, he kind of hesitated a little bit, but he did agree to it. Um, so they call the heat on the waves immediately start pumping. Like it's all time. And ultimately Billy ends up winning the event and reneges on the offer to split the money. So he kept the 25 K to himself. And then the other five surfers split the remaining money amongst themselves equally. So they all held to the deal. So anyways, um, Albie Layer and Billy grew up on Maui together. They were friends since childhood. Albie still has hard feelings about it. You can tell in his interview, he states as much and says, you know, essentially uh, throwing away a friendship over 1400 bucks or 14,000 bucks is crazy to me. Greg yeah. still has hard feelings about it as you could just tell. Um, yeah. so anyways, that release hit again, the title of the episode is about that. It's about Billy's misstep and everybody's interviewed about it. And that's the way the whole thing is promoted. If you watch the trailer, that's the way the whole thing is promoted. So it goes live and the comments section is just roasting Billy. It's just like, wow, what a dick. Like I will never buy product from one of his sponsors. People have given stories about you know, Billy paddled out to our local spot, wherever it is around the world and said, oh, it was Neos. Neos is pumping. Billy paddles out, paddles past everybody, sits there and people started giving him a hard time. Like, hey, what are you doing? And Billy goes, hey, I'm on the job right now. I clocked in. You guys are just here for fun, you know, so stay out of my way, basically. So there's these all these stories from commenters. Well, the controversy is Sam cancels the comments. Sam closed the comments on the video Oh. And um, and so, of course, the comments pop up on a separate article that was written on their website, basically just like, hey, we can't comment on the Billy article. Let's just comment over here. This is whack that they're silencing us like we're just giving our opinion on this piece. You guys are the ones who did the piece that was really roasting Billy. We're just commenting on it, you know. And so Sam started chiming in in the comments section like, hey, guys, I, I canceled it because blah, blah, blah. And he gave his reason. Uh -oh. And it, it was like three or four days of back and forth between the commentators and whatever else. Yeah. Um, and then Sam sent an email out all over the weekend saying, here's why I shut the comments down. And he gave his reasoning, which was pretty lame in my opinion yeah. and said at the end of it, but I understand your guys complaints and animosity. So I'm turning the comments back on. So the comments are back on as of four days ago, but <laughs> a lot of the original comments are deleted. Oh, Wow. Well, I didn't know about any of the, I've, I've been sort of out of it. I just watched, started watching before you and I came on live here. Yeah. And um, I had no idea that the, any of this occurred. Um, well, that's fascinating. And so there's been, has there been any, has Billy chimed in on any of this? I have not seen Billy comment at all on anything. And I haven't even gone to his Instagram feed to see if he if people are razzing him and his comments or anything like that, like his reputation, this reputation precedes him a bit, you know, like he's kind of, uh, I, I mean, honestly, I remember when this happened, when he reneged on that and didn't split the money in 2015, I remember you and I talking about it on yeah. air. Yeah. So we had found out from whoever in the space, um, that that had happened and we discussed it on air. And I think, you know, we both agreed at the time, left a bad taste in our mouth, but whatever, you know, we, you and I certainly didn't have anything invested in it and care that much, but yeah. 
I think Billy, a little bit of that has followed Billy all along. So I can't imagine he would be surprised by watching the episode or seeing what the online commentary is. And I honestly would be shocked if he was even dismayed by it. Like, yeah. you know, who can't handle a little internet jabbing at this point? Yeah. Well, it's a great episode. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's some incredible stuff that's not, doesn't even have to do with that. You know, like the stuff with Nathan Florence and, and Shane about, you know, flotation devices and, and they set it up with, Hey man, big wave surfing is about camaraderie, you know, and they, they bring in Laird and Mason, and by the way, Mason Ho is the greatest in this thing. Mason Ho is just so fun to listen to Be, he's just like some Grom down at the beach on his bike, you know, checking out the waves and telling you a story. It's just fascinating. He is the best. There's a lot of good stuff beside that sets up the end portion of it, which is this, this story about, you know, all of them agreeing and then one of them kind of going too bad. Sorry. So sad, you know? Yeah. Well, it's cool. Absolutely. I, you know, the main storyline shouldn't be Sam closing the comments because you're absolutely right. This is one of their best episodes and it only gets better and better. And I actually teased that last week on our show here that I had gotten 10 minutes into the episode at that point, And I thought it was, um, Netflix worthy in terms of like a documentary and the production quality, but the storylines are so much more compelling than most of what I watch on Netflix, because it really is the essence of man versus nature. Um, and I mean, survival of the fittest and all of that stuff. And there was so many stories that they just barely touch on the flotation, the invent invention of the inflatable vest, you know, that storyline, Greg long breaking his neck that they just barely touch on. Um, yeah. Or not not breaking his neck, almost dying. Mike Parsons yeah, Mike breaking Parsons. his neck. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Each one of those feels like, for sure, Cortez Bank could be its own. And it has been. I'm sure that Cortez, and probably in the 100-foot wave thing on HBO, but Cortez Bank could have its own series where they could probably do three or four things on it, like how it was found. I mean, have you read the book that Chris Dixon wrote about Cortez Bank? No, it's I really didn't. It's good. Yeah. It's fascinating how Cortez Bank, some like super rich guy tried to like crash a bunch of super tankers out there to create an island that he could live on and have his own nation state. You know, like it's crazy. That was in like 1953 yeah. or something. And then it goes. Through. So point is, you could have that as episode one. Episode two is Sean Collins. Episode three is they, the first uh, attack on it. Episode four is, you know, Greg Long's nightmare. Episode five is the incredible the French gal out there absolutely killing it uh, recently, you know, within the last couple, three years or whatever it is. Just, Justine DuPont. Yeah. I mean, there's, so yeah, look, that's a great thing. Mike Parsons had a horrible accident at in Ocean Beach in San Francisco. That could be a little thing. I don't think there's a lot of episodes there, but, but frankly, Mike Parsons is an app is a series, Yeah, you know, like the, that guy's career is amazing. Like the stuff that he's been, I mean, you know, the Ugg boot thing to, and, and Brad Gerlach's like that too. Like you, it's kind of an unlikely crew Gerlach and Mike Parsons who were tow partners for a number of years. Uh, you know, you didn't, I, in fact, I think you and I've seen this somewhere, but I know that, you know, they've talked about it where they were kind of like in their early days in the NSSA, they were polar opposites. Brad was kind of a rambunctious and, and sort of a free spirit. And Parsons was like by the book, you know, waxes his board the night before he goes surfing <laughs> you know just like really you know sort of a you know more scholarly and brad was yeah. kind of a wild a wild beast so uh anyway there's a lot that could be further excavated totally well for how surfers get paid this episode i highly recommend getting stab premium and going and checking it out um the fact that they can get this level of candor out of childhood friends who are now, you know, not enemies, but at odds with one another and holding resentment against one another, I think is, um, they deserve a pat on the back for that alone. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, a good, it's a really good episode. You guys need to get your stab premium or get, watch it however you need to watch it. I don't know. Totally. I wanted to give another shout out, not a shout out necessarily, but just an alert to listeners. Um, the greatest surf movie in the universe. The Von Deadly 
Nick Paulet movie. Um, that's like some animation. Uh, is yeah. that we saw a trailer for it drop about a year ago, and it is crass, rude, hilarious. Like the trailer looked insane. Um, that is touring, or it's going to be screening in the U.S. on Friday tomorrow night. So anybody who's in the U.S. They can find it. Oh God. I think Stab Magazine might have posted a list of where it's going to be playing. Um, go to Von Deadly's Instagram account. I'm sure that he has a list of it as well. But it's all over the country in major theaters. So you can find it like in AMC theaters and stuff like that. And I think it's uh showcasing everywhere at the same time in the US. So seven o'clock on the West Coast might be 10 o'clock on the East Coast. Uh, but you can find a theater near you and watch the greatest surf movie in the universe uh, for one night. And then I have no idea what the release will be like after that. But if you're interested, now's the time to see it. All right, cool. I'll check it out. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have a, an Olympic update, believe it or not. Yeah, I do believe it. I, Let's hear it. I have heard through a well-placed source that Kelly Slater's Lamar Wave Pool has put in a bid to be um, the location for the 2028 Los Angeles Olympics. Not a surprise in the least. <laughs> that wasn't breaking news. It's breaking news for sure, because it's not been reported anywhere. So this is absolutely breaking news, but this is also something that you and I have kind of uh, yeah. anticipated and discussed even. Yeah. Well, that's my breaking news that I heard from, a, like I say, a good friend of mine and a well-placed source that, and you know, it, it, it sort of sets up, probably they will, there will be bids from the wave pools in Palm Springs. Well, I, I think the Kelly is pool is a no brainer. Like I'm against it running in a wave pool, but that being said, and for all the reasons we discussed last week and maybe the week before it's a no brainer. For the Olympic organizers, for the broadcasters, the media partners, all of that, it's like, why wouldn't you do it there? It solves all of the problems that they run into traditionally. And sure, Palm Springs Surf Co. Can, or Wave Surf Club can put in a bid, but it doesn't have the clout of Kelly Slater's Surf Ranch. You know, like they've run CT events in it already. Kelly yeah. Slater's name is attached. I think that just makes a ton of sense for the organizers, unfortunately. If you're a surfer... Maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way, but if I'm one of the competitors in the Olympics, let's do this in Palm Springs, not in Fresno. Well, <laughs> I don't care yeah. what the waves are like. <laughs> I want to be hanging out in Palm Springs, man. Totally agree. And as, as a viewer, even I would prefer to watch the Palm Springs uh, version, yeah. but uh, more will be revealed. We will see where it all goes. Uh, by the way, I just wanted to find the website to direct listeners to the greatest surf movie in the universe yeah i googled it all you got to do is google it and the show times pop up so that's enough but i also found a new york times review that was posted 11 hours ago oh and i don't have a new york times subscription so it's blocking me from reading the article but the headline says the greatest surf movie in the universe review semicolon humongously bad you're kidding that's not I good well, I don't know. I don't know if the reviewer knows anything about surfing or surf films, but I think that's pretty funny. Oh man, that's a I'm, antici I'm anticipating it to be humongously good. So, all right, yeah. it has my tacit approval without any knowledge at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I hope it's good. I mean, yeah. Uh, while while we're on the subject of the Olympics, yeah. um, I mean, dude. So you called Al Cleland kind of incorrectly, but correctly. The other thing that you called similarly was breakdancing. You're like, hey, did you know breakdancing's in the Olympics? I'm like, I don't know. I think I heard about it somewhere. The clip of the Australian breaker ray gun that's been making the rounds on the internet is my favorite internet clip in maybe eight years. Like it is the funniest thing that I've seen in such a long time. So you nailed that one. Yeah, it's been... It's been going around on Instagram too. I'm sure you've seen this as like, this is how I feel after a good surf session. And they show, you know, I think Ron at board porn did something like, this is how I feel when I get a new board, you know? Or Devin posted one, I think maybe Surfy Surfy posted and Devin reposted it, which was like, um, 
my kids when we go into a public restroom and I tell them not to touch the floor and it shows <laughs> ray guns spinning around on the floor. <laughs> By the way, Surfy Surfy is my favorite Instagram account. They're, Jake, they're crushing he, it. He He's so, he's got such a good, like dry, everything's very surfy surfy. Well, they've, I feel like they've really reinvested in memes and jokes in the last year or two. Yeah. And uh, there used to be a couple here and there. Now it's kind of like that is what they're doing. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's good. It's really funny. Good fun. So do you know the backstory with Ray Gun? No. Me neither. I, I'm i sure they've somebody has already interviewed her. Or there's We'll get messages from fans filling us in. But my, my um, presumption was... Australian didn't have Australia didn't have any break dancers. And so that girl saw an opportunity of like, holy cow, I could be in the Olympics if I try out for break dancing. And then she watched maybe 10 YouTube videos and like practiced for a week and then found herself in the Olympics. That is exactly what it looks like to me. That is so great. Kind of like kind of like surfing, you know, like there's tons of countries that don't surf, but we can I can go to the Olympics, even if I don't medal, I get to go to the Olympics and say that I was an Olympian because, mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, I don't know what the qualification process was for break dancing, obviously in surfing, they'd have to go to the ISA games and make a few heats and stuff. But for her, it looks like she literally just showed up. Yeah. It's weird. You know, like the process is you, if you're a sport and you want into the Olympics, you have to have an international federation that, organizes all the nation states in, within that sport, which is the ISA for surfing. So there must be an international breakdancing association that gets all of the other nation states under that umbrella. And they sort of guide it and they put it in front of the IOC and they say, please, can, well, look, we've got enough nation states. Can you please consider us for the Olympics? And at some point they go, you're in. Is yeah. it good for TV? You're in. Is it a bunch of young people? You're in. What should we get rid of? Um, I don't know some war game of some sort, you know? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, uh, uh, breaking was not renewed for the 2028 Los Angeles, Los Angeles. Oh, well, no. I was blown away that it was in, it was just this, it was just like, it was silly. Like it was kind of almost a parody. Well, doesn't it feel that way about surfing? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of analogous actually. Yeah. Um, it's subjective. It has a lot to do with style. You know, it's like, uh, so I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, look, if they run the Olympics at, at surf ranch, then it could be argued that it won't be included in the next summer Olympics. But somebody made an interesting argument to me that I cannot believe you and I hadn't already made, which was surfing shouldn't be in the summer Olympics. If anything, it should be in the winter Olympics. Yeah. I agree. My um, my friend that I've been talking with about the Lemoore Olympic bid is suggesting the, the Winter Olympics. And yeah, I mean, think about it. Where's the next Winter Olympics, by the way? Do you know? Don't know. I don't either, but I'm wondering what ocean it's near. Let's see, yeah. it would be 2026 or no? Let me just Google real quick. Next Winter Olympics. Yeah, 2026, it's going to be... Uh, Milano in Italy Milan Italy yeah well I'm not sure there's any big wave spots I guess the nearest good big wave spot would be Morocco not big wave but like competitive you know yeah yeah see this becomes very that's this is why surfing shouldn't be in the Olympics exactly I mean say that it's in the Winter Olympics and then just run it at pipe every year that's kind of what my friend was saying Actually, the, my friend that was telling me about the Olympic bid, he's like, let's just do it at Pipeline. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we've already solved it for everybody. Just nobody's listening. Um, mm -hmm. The other big news this week, or I suppose it's going to be news next week, is uh, Surfer Magazine is back in print. I think it'll be available. It's already out there making circulation among industry uh, folk, but it will officially be hitting newsstands on August 26th if you want to be in on that. Wow, that's very interesting. All right, good. I've been uh, been reaching out to Surfer Magazine, and I haven't been able to get uh, nobody there seems to want to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> it be the first. Well, it could be the reason 
that you're reaching out is why they're not returning your calls. I have no could idea be. why you're reaching out, but could be. could be. I'm just trying to like give them some advertising money. Oh, okay. Well, money. Then that's I want to give you money. Nobody seems to want to get back to me. That's see, I would expect them to return your calls in that instance. Um, well, I'm, I reached out to Jake Howard. Jake Howard's kind of at the helm for the, uh, editor in chief position, I believe. I reached out to Jake too. He's one of the guys that never got back to me. Well, they obviously they sent a photographer to the Olympics this year, Ryan Craig, um, yeah. and they've been reporting and revamping their digital footprint. And so the magazine is now in print. Kelly Slater is on the cover. And I've got to say, Kelly Slater and Shane Dorian have morphed into the same looking human being to me. <laughs> yeah. Kelly's in the co uh, in a barrel, like pumping. It's a water shot um, in a barrel on a right. And the water photographer is almost positioned at the top of the wave, like the crest of the wave looking down. And Kelly's like pumping off the bottom in the barrel coming up. And I'm like, I swear to God, that's Shane Dorian. Why does he have an outer known sticker on his board? Um, maybe he borrowed, yeah, maybe he borrowed Kelly's board or something like that. But Presumably it isn't, and it is Kelly Slater, in fact, but those guys, I don't know if they're eating the same thing, drinking the same thing. They look like doppelgangers. Yeah, they do. And um, and as I sit here and think about Surfer Magazine, I realize they're probably super busy. I mean, putting out a print <laughs> magazine is so hard to do. Like, they're probably like, a bass called, we'll put him on the back burner. They got, they got a magazine to put out. Is it going to be monthly? I, I don't know yet. And Actually, now data point is it out of it must be out of Orange County somewhere. So now that I think about it, uh, I think I remember hearing it was going to be quarterly. Hmm. But again, don't quote me until Jake Howard returns our calls. <laughs> uh, what do you what are your what are your predictions for the print magazine surfer? Uh, you know, I want my heart wants it to be super powerful and really good. And I think it will be, but will it survive on a business level? Will there be enough advertising dollars? It's an interesting thing how it came back, right? Like part of me is like, did the industry realize they need a print magazine to kind of like drive and market the industry? Is it, did they all get together and kind of go, we don't even know what this is anymore. Why don't we just have one simple thing that's like the driving market thing, which is, you know, what they are all used to back when the magazines kind of drove the industry. And um, I'm wondering if that had something to do with it. You know, where like there were some backroom things that like we need a surf magazine. How come we don't have a surf magazine? So that's precisely the way I see it is it is now a piece of marketing. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, well, it, it always, always has been. First of all, it always was. It the always magazines was. have always been marketing vehicles. Like it always was. what they were. As much as we'd like to think, oh, it was the Bible of the sport. No, it was this thing that sold the industry, you know, sold stuff to people like you and me. So I think now it's a little bit more obvious, but I don't think that the marketing vehicle is, I think it's Surfer Magazine is an entity, the brand, right? And they are going to generate the vast majority of their revenue through their digital efforts. Yeah. But having this is almost like if you have a company that sells widgets, you print brochures for your widgets. And then you go and you put those leaflets around at potential clients. And those clients get the leaflet and they go through and they go, you know what? I do want to buy that product. And so I really think that's almost what this is at this point. And yes, there. I'm not saying the product is actually product in there, like a rip curl advertisement. You're going to buy the rip curl thing. It's more surfer as an entity is the product. And so the digital footprint is vast and wide, but you want a very narrow channel that is physical for people to be able to engage with all of your things, or maybe the most essential of your things in their hands, pass it around to friends, because there is still something about that that has proven to be you know, have a staying power that despite print dying 15 years ago, people are still buying print and they have all along the way. It's just the economics of the model that existed then weren't feasible until we've hit saturation with the digital market to make it feasible to then print the magazine as a marketing vehicle for the new vehicle. That's what it is. Yeah. Print, print magazines are now simply marketing vehicles for the brand surfer. It's not like, they might not even have any advertisements. We're like, we're advertising ourselves. That's what this thing is. We're advertising surfer magazines, digital component through this one little 
print channel. It's a, it's a fascinating thing, you know, like it's, it's, by the way, Matt Warshaw sent me, he might've sent you one too. He sent me a, an old like 1972 international surfing magazine. Did you get one of those? No, but I've heard this over the years. I've heard this story from a lot of people. They're like, I don't even know Matt, but I got something in the mail from him and it was an old magazine. It was awesome. Like an old 1972 international surfing magazine. And it was just so great to flip through it. And the, like the letters to the editor were like from guys from Palos Verdes going, don't ever come back. And, and there was a whole story in there about um, what's his name? Mike Purpose and Gary Goodrum. And these other guys go up to Seaside, Oregon and get their tires slashed by the locals at Seaside, Oregon. <laughs> but they come back with a story and some great photos. It, oh, it was just fun to, I don't know if I got caught up in the, you know, the grooviness of the of an older era or yeah i enjoyed the tactile experience of flipping through the magazine i mean i do too look i'm going to subscribe to surfer i want that yeah. issue you know Dude. but it, what it's going to call it is it number one <laughs> i doubt it it's funny though that in through the most bizarre circumstance we're discussing it now as a marketing vehicle for the brand the digital entity, whatever that is. However, this may be the most uh, sincere or um, pure form of the magazine, because if it's not funded by the advertising, like if they're not, if they're doing it as a marketing piece and doesn't need to run ads in order to cover the cost of the print, yeah. then they can really just write whatever they want and print yeah. whatever they want. Yeah. And we can get back to the most essence, you know, the most essential part right. of delivering surf stories. Yeah. It's bizarre. Well, I'm stoked for Jake Howard, actually. I'm so stoked that, you know, he's a great guy and and it's cool that he's got this opportunity. And, um, you know, I think I told you, I worked at Surfer Magazine when Jake was just sort of starting out at, um, we did this thing back then called the Surf Report. And it was basically like this little kind of like black and white newsletter that we sent out that gave you updates on what the waves were like around the world. This was, you know, in the 80s and 90s. There was obviously no internet. And Jake was involved in that. He was like one of the writers for that. And he would basically, you know, I think he had correspondence around the world. And he would just pick up the phone and go, hey, you know, what should we write in for, you know, Argentina? What should we write about the waves in Brazil? What should we write about? How is it in Alaska? And you would get this, you would subscribe to this newsletter and get it. And you could find out what the waves are like and where to stay. And basically, it was basically kind of a travel brochure. Mm. Um, but so it's cool that Jake started there and, and he's worked his way all the way to be the editor of Surfer Magazine, which still to say that you're the editor of Surfer Magazine has some, it still has some cachet, at least with me, it does. Let's hope that the era where they shuttered the print is all a distant memory and it's forgotten at some point and that this legacy continues for another 50 years of print. wonder what the gap is between... The last surfer in this new one, how many years it's been? I'm going to guess four. Yeah. So like post-COVID or pre-COVID? I think it was mid the beginning of COVID. Like 2019, 2020. I think so. Yeah. Um, and then it should be noted too, we discussed it month, six, eight months ago, but surfer is also involved in the reinvestment in the big wave awards with Bill Sharp. Yeah. Um, and yeah. centered around Nazare and them holding the ceremonies there and all that sort of stuff that Bill pulled off without their help this past year. I think they saw the success of that and um, the work that Bill was doing. And so they're now partnered in that effort too for future years. So that's really cool. That's, that's a great call. That's super good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that too, because, um, you know, Bill's a force. And so for him to now have a, a, another marketing channel, that's cool. Media partner. Um, rocketmoney.com slash surf. Just this week, my wife figured out she was paying a subscription for Showtime, but then also paying for Paramount Plus, which includes Showtime for free. That's precisely what Rocket Money was designed for. A modern tool that meticulously tracks the details that we easily get distracted from. It's a finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your monthly spending, and helps you lower your bills. It gives you freedom by helping you see your subscriptions in a simple dashboard and alerts you about hidden fees or increases. 
Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash surf. Calm the clutter in your head, simplify the tedium of your financial life, and find freedom through rocketmoney.com slash surf. So the other thing that we alluded to that is news this week is Nathan Florence receives the Waterman of the Year Award from SEMA. And uh, this has gone in the past to such dignitaries as Dirk Ziff. <laughs> I forget no, no. who. Dirk Ziff wasn't the Waterman of the Year. He was yeah. like, wasn't he like the uh, the environmentalist of the year? Or he got Dirk's Waterman the of the Year waterman? like two years ago. Hmm. Okay. I'm not kidding. Because they have separate categories. I know they have like environmentalist of the year, waterman of the year, and then there's some other like industry stalwart guy of the year or something. I would make I a way to Dirk yeah. Ziff was the waterman of the year. I'm certain of it. Okay. But anyways, that was two or three years ago. Um, I forget who it was last year. But anyways, what are your thoughts, Nathan Florence? Well-deserved. I mean, I mean, what a year it's been for him and um, – He's almost, um, he's done such so much good stuff in the last 18 months that he's raised this bar for himself that it's kind of like, it's going to be hard to meet that incredible litmus test he's put out there. Um, look, he's already, it's shocking that he's already off to uh, meeting it this year with a lot of his exploits in 2024. But I agree with you, his 2023, we've discussed it Um never been seen before you know i think there was never necessarily the economical incentive and finances to fund it and then incentive on the back end to re reap the rewards of it but he was able to figure out that whole equation but what i appreciate about it most of all is i remember an era not that long ago a couple of years ago where people would save clips they go out and they invest in a surf trip. They might get these A clips and they retain them to do something with down the road. And if there was somebody on the beach who also shot that footage, you know, they would be a, you're either begging not, Hey, please don't publish this footage. Cause we've got that. We're saving this for a special project or whatever. Uh, what I love is that we have the immediacy of what we've all been conditioned for with Instagram but the high quality production value and talent of not only surfer, but filmmakers that Nathan has with him, Zord, and it all comes together and we get to see it instantly. You know, it's like they go out there, they're on the swell yesterday. We're seeing the footage today and tomorrow on YouTube. And so it's immediate gratification plus all of the high quality stuff that you would expect to have to wait 18 months for, you know, so he's really hitting the zenith of his career. And let's be honest, John John Florence is huge shoes to fill as a brother. Like you would expect to never kind of hit those levels of whatever that John John's doing, but in his own way, Nathan really has achieved that level of greatness and profile building and lore that John John has. So it's really incredible to see. Yeah. The interesting problem, and it's a wonderful problem for them to have is They've got John John, they've got Nathan, and then they've got their brand, right? Florence Marine X. And I'm sure that at some level, Pat O'Connell and those guys are like, is it still smart to have three channels, John John, Nathan? And can we, can, will we see at some point they just go, this is the Florence YouTube channel? And they bring yeah. these guys together because it takes, now, now Nathan doesn't have to do as much. Let's bring Nathan and John John to put content on this. You know, like, can you go, hey, Nathan, we know you're killing it with your channel, but what we want to do is slowly morph it into the Florence channel. Maybe. I mean, I think there's still reason to um, keep your own profile, you know? But I think that you start sharing content, you know, it'd be interesting if YouTube invented a thing like Instagram has where you can share, you can collaborate on a post. Right. Cause Nathan can, through his association with Florence, the brand, he 
publishes on Instagram and then makes them a collaborator and then it goes out to both of their feeds and they both benefit from it. I think that is the savvy way to move forward. So if yeah. YouTube implemented something like that, that would be the solution for everybody. By the way, can I ask you a question about Instagram? It yeah. used to be that you, I could like go, hey, David, I would love if you took over my Instagram account for a day and you're the guy that posts up to my Instagram. Is that no longer a thing because of the collaboration thing that they created where instead now I would say, Dave, let you and I collaborate. Do you think that's the case? I think that's more the case now. Like you could still do the thing that you're talking about. Cause yeah, you're, I remember that moment in time where it would be like, oh, it's yeah. so-and-so takeover the account, you know, and all the messaging is coming from this person instead of the brand name now. Um, but you don't see that anymore. You don't see like I'm taking, and I think it's because of the collaborator. They're like, yeah, let's collaborate. I think you're right. Why do I want to try to get day, all of David's followers one day out of the year to maybe come over and let's just do it like exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah, it simplifies it. And then we don't have to share passwords. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, but I almost forgot as while we're on the conversation of Florence. Yeah almost forgot entirely. We do our giveaways now weekly. We've got Florence gear to give away. Ta -da! How could I possibly forget? Thank you. Yeah, um, I was look, waiting. We, I was sitting here going, aren't we giving something away again today? Hey, I was dropping the ball, man. I wasn't picking up the cue. Uh, so we give away the Channel Island stuff in the pre previous weeks. All you got to do is go to our YouTube channel. We're trying to juice the algorithm. So go to the YouTube channel, leave a comment. It you don't have there's no criteria for what the comment needs to be about. You don't have to say that you're in love with Florence, Nathan's your favorite surfer, John John's your favorite, whatever. Just engage with the episode. Give us your thoughts on what we're talking about or on Dirk Ziff being the Waterman of the Year in 2018. Um, I looked that up by the way. It was at the Waterman's Ball in Laguna. He was the Waterman of the Year. So maybe that's is the Waterman's Ball the SEMA thing or is yeah. that different? Yeah, that's so, the SEMA thing. Yeah. So it was 2018, the Waterman's Ball in Laguna. He was the Waterman of the Year. Um, anyways, share your thoughts on that. Share your thoughts on whatever. Just engage with the show on YouTube. And if you are a podcast supporter, uh, meaning you're giving us five bucks a month to support our work, then you can win. We will pick one comment at random. If you're not currently a supporter, but you want to get in on it, go and set up support today on surfsplendorpodcast.com. Then leave your comment on YouTube and we will pick one winner at random. And here's what you're going to win from Florence. A pair of board shorts and the uh, UPF rash guard. We're talking the rash guard, the hooded rash guard that has the UV protection in it that has become the uniform of surfers around the world surfing in sunny tropical climates. You're getting one of those and a pair of board shorts. It's a kit from Florence. Well, those things you and I have... have I've talked at length about how crucial those more uh, Florence Marine X rash guards are. They're incredible. Yeah. And basically, and what's there's so many good things about it, but one of the super cool things about it is you just grab it and put it in your bag and your sunscreen's done. Like you're pretty much done. You do got to kind of lather the face. And I mean, you wear it all day long in the surf and then you just pop the, the hood off and you rinse your head and put it back on. And I won't, ever go on any tropical surf trip without that thing and, and it's in the back of my car now and i wear it now when i'm you know the water 73 in southern california is beautiful and it's august and and i'm wearing it all the time right now totally and the hood has a little visor brim on it too so what we'll do is you paddle out and it's sunny you pull that on pull it down tight pull the chin up high so very little of your face is exposed that's covering your eyes which helps a lot and then maybe if you're catching a wave and you don't want it on, it's easy just to pop off, you know? So there, it's an incredible product. We love it. Fits well. There's a key pocket in the back if you uh, if you have that one. It was a modern update to it. Um, so anyways, or so win that by leaving a comment on today's show on YouTube. And then um, if you don't win it, but you want to save 20%, we can save you 20% with florencemarinex.com slash surf as well, which is pretty big. Oh. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so thrilled to see it for Nathan, thrilled to see SEMA making an amazing call there. I can't think of a more, you know, the term waterman itself is just Nathan exemplifies it. Um, all of that, they do this event, the waterman's ball to raise money, by the way, uh, for ocean health. 
And so we can also state Surfrider Foundation is hitting their 40th anniversary on August 22nd. So that's going to be next Thursday, August 22nd, a week from today, in fact, is their 40th anniversary. And as part of their 40th anniversary, they're doing 10 days of giveaways. So if you go to surfrider.org slash 40, there's a little um, email address thing, put your email address there in, and that'll get you included in, into win a bunch of Yeti gear, like Yeti, not only the flasks, but like actual coolers, big expensive stuff. So all to celebrate surf riders, 40 years of incredible work. You know what happened at the 20th anniversary of the surf rider foundation anniversary party? There was, I'm dying to know. Well, one of the things is that Matt Kivlin built them an incredible Malibu chip out of balsa wood. Uh, Matt Kivlin, the last time he had built a board was 1961. Then for the 20th anniversary in 2004, he built them one of the Mal one of the Matt Kivlin Malibu chips, which the California Gold Surf Auction is going to be, we're going to have that board in our auction. Wow. Wow. So it's an incredible board and a super rare, very hard to find Matt Kivlin's because he just simply didn't make any. I mean, after 1961, he got into architecture school and went became an architect and stopped making surfboards. That's incredible. So somebody, was it like an auction at yeah. the Surfrider event? Somebody bid yeah, on it, Matt won Kivlin, it? And... Yeah, they did a surfboard auction for the 2004 20th anniversary. Matt Kivlin made them a board for that. So did Joe Quigg. So did Hobie Alter. Wow. So did Phil Edwards. Um, and we happen to have those boards, all bosses, in the California Gold Surf Auction coming up in October. That's incredible. Yeah. Good on you. Well, go support another 20 years of Surfrider Foundation. Go to surfrider.org, set up your membership. There's over 200 chapters. They've collected over a million pounds of trash at this point. Like, And like I said, they're keeping data on all this stuff and submitting it to make policy change. So it's an incredible organization. Cool. Um, I've got a Duke again this week, Scott. Oh, wonderful. Um, the, let's see. Do you remember, would have been two years ago at least, uh, Troy Eckert got that insane wave down in Baja. Yes. And he had just turned 50 yes. and he wrote this beautifully, beautiful prose on Instagram yes. explaining all of the, it was a culmination. It was all of this spiritual work that he had done that put him in the position plus 30 plus years, 40 years of surf experience. And he got the wave of his life at the age of 50, right? Well, guess what he got on Friday last week? Another one? Another, another one. Another wave of his life. How um, many are you allowed to have? Because I'm I'm kind of feeling like I probably have 10 waves of my life. Are you writing flowery prose on Instagram about how prosaic uh, the experience was? I'll, I'll texting you and texting my bros and going, hey, I got such a fun wave at tabletops yesterday. <laughs> you gave a you gave us a pretty good version of this when you got back from Indo. Um and I got a couple messages from people who are inspired by it where they're like, dude, to think like Bass just got the session of his life at his age, like, and considering all the sessions that he's had is pretty, I want that. Yeah. Yeah. It does take work. Troy's right though. It does, it does take some work, you know, like all these things have to line up and you got to do your part, you know, stay healthy and book the trip and know the swell and you know, where, nowhere to go where you're going to be by yourself. And then you got to do it. You got to, get to your feet and do all the stuff. I'm stoked for Troy that he's gotten his second wave of his life. Tell me more about it. So I will read his Instagram post to you. Um, but I do want to say I interviewed him after that other wave in Baja. And it was great to hear him like fully explain what, you know, brought him to that moment. Um, and I've followed him ever since. And he's been really invested in a spiritual journey. And interestingly, Griffin Colapinto, Koa Smith, there's a few other surfers who have brought him in as part of their coaching team. And so I, it appears that they have like strategic coaches and competitive coaches, but then he is kind of this spiritual coach that is helping them stay grounded and dialed into what their true 
um, desires are without getting caught up with any of the fame, you know, that comes yeah. with all of this. And so it's been interesting to watch that and see other people lean on him. But anyways, Newport Point last week, I don't mind saying it. Oh, I wasn't allowed man. to say it up until four years ago, but now everybody says it. Oh, um, God, pumping. I know. So it shows him the wave is worth watching. The wave is kind of a must-see moment on Is that own. the wave I've seen on Instagram where he's – it, like they – they show the wave breaking off the jetty and you don't know if there's anyone in it until at the end. And then somebody comes out. I don't think it's that one because there's no jetty. And then it's also the beat. So that I'm looking at is the beat. So you can see it all happen. It's an insane left long, really incredible barrel ride. And he takes, he fades uh, Nate, Nate Yeomans on the takeoff. And so that's more what this Instagram is about. Uh, but it's great still to hear what he has to say about that. He says it was a special day last Friday at Newport Point. In my three plus decades, I've been surfing there. I've only surfed it like that maybe 10 times total. I'm not totally sure how many, but it's a fickle wave and it sure is one of a kind when it gets good. Uh, sometimes it'll go two or three years without a proper, proper tropical swell of substance. My intention, note the word intention, that seems to be important to him. He says, my intention these days is to enjoy my time surfing and be the best version of myself in and out of the water. Being almost 52, I realize my days surfing these types of waves at this level are numbered, but that's okay. For us old guys who know how many, who knows how many more sessions we'll have where our bodies allow us to surf waves like this. But this is no excuse for dropping in on at big deluxe underscore. That's Nate Yeomans. <laughs> it's just the truth. And so I'm grateful I can still do this like I can. This happens, things out there happen super fast because of the big playing field and the short interval between waves and of course the crowds. Everybody wants a good one and there's only so many to go around. On this one, I don't remember too much, but when I came, when it came into view, I paddled super hard to get into the spot to catch it. I felt someone near me, but I was so focused on looking down the line because I was because it was stretching out. I was super head down and committed to say the least. I thought whoever was behind me had pulled back at the last second, but that's obviously not what happened. It was one of the better waves that I had out there in years. But once I got back out to the lineup, Nate said that he was behind me. The wind got knocked right out of my sail at the moment. And I just apologize for my mistake. Being the gracious and rad human that Nate is, he said, no worries or something like that. If it was anyone else, else out here, I wouldn't be cool with it. But since it's you, it's totally cool. You owe me a 12 pack. Uh, then we had a laugh about it and squashed it right there. Later, I heard that he got some of the sick, some other sick ones that day. So I was stoked on that. It's so refreshing to have somebody actually receive your apology, which creates unification, not divisiveness, which is usually not what happens in surfing. So thank you, Nate, for being an example for other surfers uh, who are in situations like this. That's cool, man. Stoked to hear that. That's really yeah. great. Yeah, really cool. Epic to see. And um, what else I appreciated about this, just reviewing the footage, is Troy Eckert's clearly a super high-level surfer. And for him to explain that he did not see Nate is uh, incredible because Nate is clear as day. <laughs> like, when you look at the footage, Nate is clear as day, deeper, out front, like he had to, Troy had to have the blinders on completely to not notice Nate. Nate could not be more obvious in that moment, but it's a reminder that no matter what level you're at, that's how much you have to have the blinders on it. Sometimes when the waves are like that to really get into the position to do it, you know? So it's a good reminder that everybody makes mistakes. Yeah, that's cool. I, I was out um, foiling a couple, three or four days ago and um this guy paddled out and he started asking me about it. Like, Hey, you know, how, what's, what's the deal? How much do they cost? Blah, blah, blah. And it was a guy that I recognized that I had, um, I had sort of, I don't want to say snapped on him, but I sort of said, you know, I forget exactly what happened, but regardless of what happened, he certainly didn't deserve for me to, you know, just be kind of jerky about it. You know, like I probably could have handled it better is all I'm saying, you know? And so I go, I explained to him about the, the foil or something. And then he started to paddle away and I went, Hey, I need to, I need to apologize. 
you'll probably remember a couple of years ago out here, I, I snapped on you a little bit and that's not the way I want to be, you know, that's not the way I want to, that's just, you know, I'm trying to be better. I'm, I'm still, I can still be a jerk. You know, I'm not perfect. And he was super cool. He's like, yeah, I remember. Blah, blah, blah. And it was cool though, but he was, and so guess what? We're friends now, you know, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I think I've told you this before, and it, it's something that I wish I knew when I was younger. And it's, and I maybe I did know it, but I was just too hard headed and too much of a, too selfish. But it's this concept of people are never going to remember what it is that you told them, or what you said to them, um, or any information that you think you're passing along to them. They don't remember that. The only thing they remember is how you made them feel. And I think that's probably some of the stuff that Troy is talking about when he says it's so cool that, you know, somebody yeah. can accept my apology. And I think that simple little thing, if we can all just when we're interacting, when I'm interacting with you, when you're interacting with me, when we're interacting with each other in the world, if we can just remember to focus on. How is this person going to feel when when I walk away from this conversation or this interaction? And that would do wonders for me if I could remember that. Of course, I, I fall short all the time, but um, it's pretty cool, Troy, to, to give his insight there. The opening sentence, too, that relates to what you're talking about is him saying, my intention with this session was to be the person that I want to be in the water and out of the water because it's so easy once you when the waves are like that certainly and when there's that many people you hit the water and it's like forget about who i want to be like let primal instinct take over yeah you know what i mean and then you're everything's heightened and then you're just responding out of kind of automatic i was talking to somebody yesterday about austin my kid two-year-old kid two and a half year old kid austin and um he's a good kid, you know? And like, I, I'm shocked to see other kids who have like some little vind vindictive bone in their body, you know, and they're like trying to get something or hurt somebody else. Cause I just can't imagine him doing that. And, uh, there's a glowing parent, of course, talking about the greatness of their <laughs> child. But, but the point that I'm getting at is, um, I was like, you know, he has, uh, an unlimited amount of, love comfort support nutrition shelter warmth all of these things around him you know that like he's never once had to worry about and if you do worry about those things then you start collecting you know and you start like hoarding and then you start thinking mine instead of yours and like wait now i gotta protect and you get a little bit on edge and you start making decisions and choices out of that threat and that emotional responsiveness. And so I was like, you know, he'll, he'll get out in the world and he'll develop other things that we can't protect him from. And then he's going to have versions of him that I don't identify or that I'm maybe not um, thrilled with how he's behaving in the future or stuff like that. But at this moment, it was like, I recognized that so much of our emotional responses are to do with those things it's just to do with feeling a threat or wanting to protect some vulnerability you know so yeah that's true it's it's uh it's not them it's me <laughs> yeah so that's that's where troy's talking about you go out in the lineup where it is you know it's a not necessarily death defying situation but not that far from it and there's tons of people and you're fighting over a finite resource and so it's easy to regress to your uh, default human state. And so let's keep an intention here and let's just go out and be the person you want to be. So yeah, that's, that's what I liked about that Instagram. Well, he's a great Duke. You've chosen a great Duke. I have a Duke. It's Terry Sennett, shaper from Orange County, legendary shaper has been uh, shaping boards out of San Clemente forever. Uh, he just retired, I learned. And so um, my tip of the cap to Terry Sennett, who's built some incredible surfboards for so many surfers in the San Clemente area and beyond. And um, so shout out to Terry Sennett.
man, that shop in San Clemente, it's shocking to drive by it and not see Senate uh, logo hanging up on the outside of it. You know, it's something else now. It's like, I forget what it was when I drove by a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, total shock because he is a 50, 50 years in the business. Yeah. Long time. He's made some great surfboards, man. Yeah. um, Yeah. So yeah, shout out Senate. Good call. All right. Well, look, we've said a lot. Lots been discussed. Um, Until next time, David, adios and aloha. Scott, SantaBarbaraIceBath.com. Don't you want to have your inflammation reduced, improved recovery? I need an ice bath right now, man. I am beat up. And uh, I would love to do four minutes in an ice bath and come out and just be invigorated. Santa Barbara Ice Bath Company. That's all you need. Four minutes. That's what's crazy about it. It's like the ultimate quick solve for so many of your problems. Yeah, it's 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 good. I mean, inflammation, apparently it does stuff for digestion. I'm sure it does stuff um, for your brain chemistry. Like, and again, I've mentioned to you, Andrew Huberman, there's podcasts out there where these there's guys that are just um, fully involved in the science behind uh, the ice bath. So I would urge people to take take a listen and um, get some more insight. Totally. Yeah. So fat loss, depression and anxiety relief, like it boosts your state, um, immune response. It improves your sleep. And this is all just kind of a four, like you said, four minutes max even. I mean, you could probably get it done in less. Anyways, Santa Barbara Ice Bath is a good friend of ours. And um, he has three models available, one entry-level model, one mid-tier model, and then one super fancy model. But they're all gorgeous to look at. The original kind of concept behind the brand was you shouldn't. this shouldn't be something that you hide away on the side of your house. This should be a centerpiece of your backyard that is like part, it's beautiful furniture, you know, and they are. So go, if you're interested in uh, getting one for yourself, or if you're just interested to see the beauty that we're talking about, go to santabarbaraicebath.com, check it out. They will deliver it, set it up, install all that sort of stuff. And then also realwatersports.com, Scott. Wow. Trip's been away. He's been on a Trip's been on a trip. He's been in Uluwatu and uh, been getting some great texts from Trip. And uh, look, Real Water Sports is in North Carolina. And David and Scott, we both are big fans of logging on to their site. And um, if you need a new board, if you need a new wetsuit, if you need gear, if you need a board bag, if you need some foil stuff, you might need one of those Marine uh, Florence X Marine. Is it Marine Florence? Florence X. Florence Marine X. Well, yeah, I'm. What is it? Only, am I the only one that gets confused by that? Probably. No. Others. Florence Marine X, that rash guard, that's just an absolute must. Whatever it is that you need regarding surfing, Real Water Sports is your one-stop shop. So we, uh, trip is ubiquitous. Somehow he pops up all over the place. Like you said, I was up at um, David Verner surfboards in Santa Cruz. And I walk up and Werner's on the phone. Somebody's on speakerphone. He's holding it. And he's like talking, talking. And he's like, hold on, I'll be with you in a second. And I, I'm sitting there listening and I'm like, that voice sounds familiar. So I'm like, Hey, Werner, is that trip Foreman? He goes, what? How do you know trip Foreman? And then I lean in and I'm like, trip. And he's like, David. So trip, I recognize trip voice. Trip recognizes my voice. And Werner's yeah. just like, what the heck? Um, so that was an incredible connection and Werner's surfboards are available at real water sports In- interestingly trip sells a lot of Werner's boards but that's not why they were on the phone they were on the phone because trip was ordering a surfboard from Werner, <laughs> which i was like dude that's not that's the last thing you need Werner's like shut up let me close this sale <laughs> good for him good for trip he's trips a board guy man there, there's no thought about it yeah so go get a Werner at realwatersports.com All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Talk to you later. See you next week.